so we've come now to the final talk for our session. Um, this one's by Art McDonald. He did his PhD at Caltech on excitation energies and decay properties of isospin three half states of oxygen, fluorine, and sodium. Uh, he then moved to Chalk River uh, uh, Nuclear Laboratories, which is near Ottawa. He then became a professor at Princeton and then moved on up to Queens. And then, of course, in the 1980s, he formed the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, which resolved the solar neutrino problem, confirmed oscillations, and was recognized internationally, uh, including by the Nobel Committee and the Breakthrough Prize Committee. Not satisfied with this level of success, he continues his explorations uh, as a part of the DEEP 3600 experiment looking for dark matter and SNOW plus to test if a uh, lepton number is violated. Um, so go ahead, Art. I'll give you warning at uh, 25 minutes. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so I've been, I've been asked to give a largely uh, historic uh, <clears throat> talk, uh, looking back to the 20 years over which uh, neutrino physics has progressed since uh, our uh, first results in uh, 2001. And I'll go back even a little bit further than that. I'll talk a lot about the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory that made that report uh, in uh, 2001. This is actually a picture in the lower right here of the inside of the detector. Uh, so uh, perhaps we can have a little bit of art associated with our uh, profession as well. Uh, so uh, the, uh, uh, there we go. <clears throat> this effort occurred uh, primarily because of uh, what had come to be known as the solar neutrino problem, uh, which arose because Ray Davis and his pioneering uh, experiments with chlorine had detected explicitly electron neutrinos at a rate that was uh, uh, three times lower than the calculations of John Bacall and others, primarily John at that time. This was actually uh, based on a suggestion, amazingly, by Bruno Carnacarro back in the uh, 1940s about the possibility of observing neutrinos with chlorine uh, from the sun. And there were a couple of interpretations of this discrepancy between theory and experiment, one of them being a problem with either the theory or experiment, but also the possibility that uh, there might be a change in flavor of the electron neutrinos to muon and tau neutrinos, which would not have been detected, uh, which was an outgrowth of the uh, uh, original work that Bonacoro had done in 1957 uh, suggesting the possibility of oscillation between electron neutrinos and their anti-particles. Uh, so in uh, 1984, we were faced with a, a situation where this was still a, uh, a substantial possible problem. And Herb Chen had the audacity to ask, suggest that perhaps we could collect enough heavy water to, uh, uh, to do uh, such a, a measurement using it. The properties of heavy water had been known for some time. In terms of the fact that they predict to electron neutrinos and the other sensitive to all active neutrino types. But the proposal for uh, uh, enough heavy water to do this was certainly in excess of $300 million, but remarkably, it appeared as though that could be available in Canada. And uh, Herb Chen and George Ewan uh, began uh, this project with 16 of us at that time, uh, which grew to be the snow collaboration over the years. There are another number of other measurements that were made as you, as you can see on the, uh, on the graph at the, at the top, which had uh, thresholds, uh, which would enable them to observe not only the boron eight neutrinos that snow observed, uh, and also super chemo candy and then super chemo candy, but also with chlorine, of course, uh, with the threshold uh, enabling also beryllium seven to contribute and PP neutrinos uh, being uh, the dominant effect in the gallium experiments, SAGE and, and Galax. 
However, in 1984, it was really uh, Davis's uh, uh, observations that were to be tested. And the reason why heavy water was particularly useful for this uh, is the fact that if you have a deuterium nucleus, then specifically electron neutrino can uh, create the charge current reaction that gives you a fast moving electron that can give a Cherenkov cone. And uh, the other reaction that you can do is one in which essentially any neutrino type with equal sensitivity to all of them can break apart deuterium, leaving a, a free neutron in the heavy water. And I'll tell you in a moment the three ways we detected those neutrons. And of course, then if you compare those two reactions, specifically electron with all neutrino types, you're able to determine whether or not electron neutrinos have changed into other neutrino types uh, without reference to uh, solar calculations. But on the assumption that that is the mechanism that's occurring, then you have in this second reaction a measure of how many there were in the first place, and therefore a test of solar models for boron-8 neutrinos. Now, you have to be very careful because any gamma ray greater than 2.2 MeV has the capability of photo disintegrating deuterium and producing a free neutron. And so as has been the case for solar neutrino measurements uh, throughout the years, extreme care with respect to the control of radioactivity uh, was important in this experiment. And we were ultimately able to, to constrain background radioactivity to be much less than the signal from the second reaction. There is, of course, a third reaction that takes place uh, in heavy water as well as in light water. And this is a reaction that Super Kamiokande and Kamiokande before them used to observe uh, neutrinos from the sun. In this case, the uh, sensitivity is predominantly to electron neutrinos, but about one sixth of the interactions take place uh, with all neutrino types. And in fact, the first results from Snow in 2001 were a comparison of the charge current reaction with the results of Super Kamiokande. So this was phase one uh, of the experiment uh, in which the second reaction is observed by the capture of a neutron on, on heavy uh, water, while well, on deuterium, giving you a 6.25 MeV gamma ray. In the second phase of the experiment, we uh, uh, added several tons of sodium chloride, enabling the capture of a neutron by chlorine 35, which increased the efficiency significantly and also enabled the separation of neutral current and charge current events because the decay of uh, chlorine 35 plus a neutron after uh, capture uh, was much more isotropic than the, uh, uh, than the single electron from the charge current reaction. And then in the third phase, finally, uh, we uh, uh, installed a large array of proportional counters, and we were able to detect those neutrons uh, explicitly in, uh, in a helium-3 filled proportional counter. You're looking at it end on here, and there's a total of 400 meters of such proportional counters. The detector itself <clears throat> was uh, uh, housed uh, two kilometers underground in uh, Inco's uh, Creighton mine near Sudbury, very active nickel mine. It's still an active mine and, and in fact is the home for Snow Lab, which was expanded uh, beyond the capabilities of the uh, snow experiment and is now housing uh, many other experiments in uh, underground science. Um, the reason it was somewhat audacious to uh, suggest that we might get uh, heavy water, and the original proposal was for 4,000 tons. Uh, we were able, however, to obtain 1,000 tons on loan from the Canadian government reserves. Heavy water is used in the Canadian style nuclear reactor, with, which enables uh, natural uranium to be used rather than enriched uranium. Concept is that you have ultra pure 
heavy water in the middle in a 12 meter diameter acrylic sphere, five centimeters in uh, uh, thickness, which is surrounded by uh, 10,000 uh, eight inch or 20 centimeter Hamamatsu phototubes. Uh, and that is all immersed in a bath of ultra pure light water, about 7,000 tons. And that is all contained within a cavity which is lined with Urolon plastic, which provides both a water and radon seal uh, for the detector. And so there's about a 10 to the sixth reduction in radioactivity from the rock to the center of the detector. From uh, uh, about a part, pardon me, it's, a, it's about <laughs> 10 to the ninth reduction of a, from about a part in a million uranium and thorium, which, is, which are the main isotopes that can photo disintegrate deuterium down to part in 10 to the 15th in the middle of the detector. This shows the construction. And during construction, we had ultra clean conditions overall. Uh, everyone took a shower and uh, uh, changed into lint-free uh, clothing. You can see the, the efforts to manufacture the acrylic sphere from uh, 120 separate panels bonded in place on uh, uh, a very uh, well-designed uh, jig for holding the panels. Uh, and uh, the phototubes, uh, which are uh, looking in at the uh, central region until uh, we reached a point where we had to, to remove it. We had dust covers on those, uh, uh, on those detectors. About a, mic, about a gram of dust on the entire detector in the whole process of construction. Radioactivity was measured very carefully. And uh, it was by this process, we were able to both restrict it through purification and determine it through measurement. Uh, in the low energy region of the data from the phototubes, you can see that the uranium chain in blue and the thorium chain in red had somewhat different profiles for their isotropy. And it was possible to separate them. Uh, I don't expect you to see the detail in these, in these uh, uh, plots on the right, but the red line across here was the goal of having uh, less than, as it turns out, uh, gamma rays less than four times or greater than four times smaller than the signal from the neutral current uh, measurement and measured to on the order of 30%, which was a much smaller fraction, of course, of the signal. This schematically shows you uh, the way in which the signals look when you look at the number of hit phototubes for events, which is proportional, of course, to the amount of energy uh, of the event. Uh, and in this case, for the first paper, uh, after uh, a little over a year's data, we uh, uh, decided at first to simply make a measurement of the charge current reaction, which you see here in blue, not yet addressing the neutral current reaction, which came in our second paper about six or eight months later. Um, in doing that, we were able to determine a very accurate, me well, at the time, very accurate measurement of the charge current because the background, which you see here in black, uh, turned out to be very much what we had aimed at in our original design. The elastic scattering is a smaller cross section and is also directionally uh, determined as pointing from the sun and could be removed from the, uh, the process. But it is the measurement that was made by Super Cameo Candy using light water. Uh, and in this case, they were looking up to that well at that point for any evidence of uh, uh, something other than simply a reduction in the flux, uh, such as a distortion of the spectrum or a day night effect, uh, which they subsequently observed, but at that point had not observed it. But if we combine our measurement of the charge current uh, reaction and their overall measurement of the elastic scattering, we observed a difference between them, which corresponded to about a 3.3 sigma effect. And that was the first observation. 
the uh, next paper that we put forward, we moved the threshold down so that we could also observe the 6.25 MeV gammas from the capture of neutrons in the deuterium. And then we had data that looked like this overall in terms of that spectrum. And you can see here uh, what was uh, the breakdown of the charge current and neutral current con contributions to that spectrum. You can see here the radial profile, uh, which is where the background from the, uh, in the experiment is predominantly uh, from the outside. One is the radius of the uh, acrylic sphere, and this is, uh, these are volume increments. Um, you can see the in the region of interest, we're really dominated by the signals, and the background is only a small part of the region that we're dealing with here. You can also see that in terms of directionality to the sun, elastic scattering points back, and the others followed the pre-determined pre, uh, uh, results. We did a hypothesis test in order to be able to determine that, in fact, neutrinos were, in fact, changing their flavor. The hypothesis test was seeing whether this spectrum could be explained by no flavor change, no distortion, uh, and uh, therefore doing a fit for the, for the rates. What we determined is with about 5.3 sigma significance that it could not be explained by uh, not having uh, flavor change. And therefore, uh, we were confirming the flavor did change uh, with that degree of accuracy. And these are the fluxes as determined uh, at that time. What's interesting perhaps is to compare what we predicted in 1987 when we were starting the experiment uh, in the two cases, heavy water and sodium chloride. Uh, and uh, this is using the fraction of, of coverage with photo tubes that we proposed at the time and you can see the red curve here corresponds to the red curve here for pure heavy water. The uh, blue curve corresponding to the neutral current reaction, of course, is much lower, 14% efficiency. Whereas if you put in salt, that becomes the dominant effect here. And with the isotropy, we were able to determine the spectral shape as well, which matched the expected spectral shape from uh, boron-8 neutrinos in the sun. If you plot, <clears throat> as we did in the first paper, but here in, in more detail, the, the extracted flux for the mu and tau neutrinos, this is after the salt phase, and the much greater accuracy, you see that the charge current reaction, which you represented by this red bar, of course, has no sensitivity at all to mu and tau neutrinos because they're explicitly electron neutrinos. The neutral current uh, reaction is this blue bar here, which is equally sensitive to all neutrino types. And the intersection of those two gives you your accuracy in terms of defining either one of them. And what you see is our measurement of the elastic scattering reaction, which has a different sensitivity shown in green, and the super cameo candy measurement at the time and you can see there's generally good agreement. And it corresponds to approximately uh, one third of the neutrinos having changed their flavor. Uh, and it gives you a result for the total flux of active neutrinos from the sun that was in reasonable agreement with uh, uh, two of the calculations that were uh, at the most sophisticated stage at that point. And uh, you can see here that the charge current to neutral current ratio was only about a third. For the third phase, we added uh, 400 meters of ultra low radioactivity, uh, helium three filled proportional counters. They were installed with a, a small uh, remotely controlled submarine in a series of, uh, uh, of detectors, which in themselves had less radioactivity than the radioactivity uh, that we were finding uh, residual in the heavy water itself. And quite a remarkable accomplishment in itself. With the 
<clears throat> with these detectors, uh, we had, uh, as you can see on the left here, uh, with intentionally calibrating them with a neutron source, uh, a reaction where you uh, capture a neutron and helium-3 and produce the protons and tritons, and you see a significant signal. We also put in some detectors that had helium-4 in them, and therefore we were able to determine uh, backgrounds in the detectors. Uh, the uh, 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 brown data here is the actual data in the experiment uh, compared with the calibrations. And with this, we were able to uh, do some further work to eliminate internal alpha radioactivity by pulse shape discrimination as well. And we did a final full joint analysis of the data in 2013 from all three phases, providing the ultimate sensitivity, which corresponded to uh, this accuracy on the charge current to neutral current ratio, much greater than seven sigma in terms of it not being, uh, well, in terms of it implying a flavor change. And we got a very accurate measure of the boron-8 uh, total flux as well. Uh, note that this particular ratio is very sensitive to the uh, mixing angle theta-1-2. Uh, and uh, that was a, a substantial contribution from these solar neutrino measurements, whereas CAMLAN has a much greater sensitivity to delta M when it comes to the fitting of data. Uh, these are the 273 authors, and uh, the people in red are the people who were country co-spokesmen for uh, Canada, US, and the UK during the process of the project. So this summarizes the data not only from uh, SNOW, but also from the other experiments that had taken place in the interim. Uh, and uh, what you can see is that uh, in the ratio of the observed events compared to the standard solar model prediction, uh, you would expect therefore from theory for the result to be here if there are no oscillations. But the gallium experiment with sensitivity to PP neutrinos showed too few, as did the original chlorine measurements, explicitly electron neutrinos, which is in reasonable agreement with what we measured with the charge current reaction, also explicitly electron neutrinos. Superchemio candy, of course, had a slightly larger number because of the contribution from neutral current events with all neutrino types. That is the difference that we used for our original measurement in 2001. This shows our measurements of the neutral current reaction, all of which are in reasonable agreement with each other and with theory. So now if you take the snow results and combine them with these beautiful measurements by uh, Sage and Galax and GNO, and of course, Kamiokande and Super Kamiokande uh, with sensitivity to various different, uh, and the original chlorine, sensitivity in various ways to these different reactions in the sun, but of course, identical sensitivity uh, only to boron-8 for both the uh, uh, water and the, and the heavy water measurements, and then do a fit to that and include, do a fit using the uh, PMS uh, Ponocarbo uh, Maki Nakagawa Sakata uh, formalism with finite mass, uh, then uh, you find that basically there's an adiabatic transformation so that everything is mass two leaving the sun and remains that way reaching the earth. That also gives you an opportunity to determine through interaction with the electrons in the uh, sun uh, through the MSW effect that mass two is greater than mass one. In 2003, CAMLAN came up with a very beautiful measurement using reactor neutrinos, which showed a wonderful oscillation pattern in the final results in 2013. And the parameters for uh, these measurements of vacuum oscillation of antineutrinos matched very well with the solar uh, numbers. And so uh, in this, uh, this is the, the famous old uh, particle data group plot that they don't have in their latest version, but it shows 
the sensitivity of various experiments. And there's a very good complementarity between Camland and Snow in that on this plot of delta m squared versus tan squared theta, uh, Camland is narrow in the delta m squared uh, direction and Snow uh, in, the, uh, in the theta direction. So uh, uh, this is the status at least uh, a couple of years ago of, of the parameters uh, for uh, the one, two system studied in both of these experiments. Now, Snow has gone on to do further analysis, uh, in particular, looking at all of the data to look for evidence for the HEP neutrinos that are projected with the solar model to be uh, occurring at higher energies and with this sort of uh, sensitivity relative to the data. Of course, we've run out of uh, data. Uh, and uh, But if you combine all of them, it's possible to set a limit which is uh, somewhat larger than the predicted number, but in the same uh, vicinity. And I think this is right now the best sensitivity as, as uh, uh, Professor Wen showed in the previous slide. That is what one might expect the very large experiments in the future to be able to address the high energy region uh, of the uh, spectrum. So also did studies of many other things including periodicities for solar neutrinos uh, and other uh, measurements, which in fact, a number of these papers have been published in the last five years with a rejuvenation of activity on the analysis, analysis of, uh, of snow. And so uh, I was talking uh, predominantly on uh, solar neutrinos. And so I'll move on because there is this beautiful set of experiments from the Boraxino uh, collaboration, which really has defined uh, the uh, set of reactions in the sun that dominate the PP cycle and now most recently the CNO. And they have set up an experiment which is exquisite in its approach to the reduction of radioactivity. All elements of the uh, radioactivity uh, control that's necessary to make these measurements in the low energy region uh, is, were uh, addressed in these experiments, enabling them to make measurements of the PP, beryllium-7, PEP, boron-8, of course, but with less sensitivity than uh, snow and super-K, uh, but a lower threshold, uh, and ultimately recently the CNL. Now, the difficulties you run into, and this is why the very large experiments will have trouble trying to work below about uh, 2.6 uh, MeV, which is uh, where uh, the uh, uh, lead uh, 2.6 MeV gamma rays uh, provide a limit. Uh, the uh, reason why it's difficult to work in this region, first of all, depth. Uh, <clears throat> Boraxino is very uh, innovative in uh, being able to get rid of this bump, which comes from carbon-11 decay by, uh, from, from muons penetrating by eliminating data when a muon had penetrated, getting it down to this figure on the left. But there still was a substantial difficulty in attempting to deal with the CNO because of this bismuth-210 uh, interference with the CNO. Uh, shape. Uh, they also used uh, a very nice discrimination between positrons and electrons, and of course the radial profile as well in order to do their uh, their measurements. However, they made very nice measurements of both PP, which is a tour de force uh, down in this region. The green line here is carbon fourteen that uh, uh, that can interfere uh, with it, but in this region in here they were able to get a reasonable measure of the PP. And of course, the beryllium-7 is a clear uh, shoulder, and PEP could be determined in that region. This is what the particle data group summarizes in terms of the Boraxino measurements and the Snow and Super Kamiokande uh, measurements uh, for the 
oscillation of electron neutrinos uh, by the one two process uh, from the sun to the earth, you can see that for the uh, lower energy neutrinos, you're, you're basically dealing with uh, parameters that are uh, equivalent to uh, vacuum oscillation. But you begin to see the matter effect at the higher energies and, they, and it substantially affects the boron eight uh, spectrum. In order to do the CNO, they really had to do a, a major effort to reduce this bismuth 210 contribution, which is uh, the uh, daughter product, the beta decaying radioactivity, daughter product of a, of a lead decay. And, and if you compare this blue line on this plot, the eventual one, with the green line on this plot, you can see they've lowered it by at least an order of magnitude. And in order to do that, what they had to do was to avoid the convection currents that were moving the radioactivity throughout the detector. This shows this, uh, it was measured by polonium, which is the subsequent daughter. You can see that it was a mess before they uh, started their temperature control by insulating the detector. They now have insul They now have controlled the uh, the whole room, and I think the future data for the next uh, while will be even better than what you see here for the measurement of the CNO. Gray is their measurement, and the two different uh, metallicities in the sun are represented by the blue and pink bands here, which is part of the objective of attempting to observe the uh, CNO cycle, neutrinos. Super K has continued to uh, uh, work on uh, their measurements of solar neutrinos. And this is the latest status of uh, combination of data from them and snow and uh, using a delta M squared from Canland presented by uh, Michael Smee in 2018. And you can see that there is now an indication of an upturn as, as expected from the LMA fit. Uh, <clears throat> they will continue to, to do this after they have installed the gadolinium. In future solar neutrino measurements, uh, uh, as I mentioned uh, uh, in the second bullet here, or the third, um, future large detectors will contribute to the high energy region and uh, therefore to the HEP measurement and, and uh, because of statistics, probably uh, uh, to the boron eight shape in the region above uh, two and a half MeV or so, or so. For the lower energy region, Snow Plus and Camland would have capability ultimately to look in this lower energy region, but uh, uh, they would have to reduce the uh, daughters of radon in, in the form of polonium and bismuth uh, by several orders of magnitude in order to do that. And so as they proceed with their measurements, they'll mainly be contributing above two and a half MeV. Finally, large noble liquid dark matter detectors can also do solar neutrino measurements. And because of the fact that they are uh, a liquid, uh, a gaseous liquid, which can be recirculated and purified, uh, they may be able to get around this problem with, uh, with business, bismuth and address the low energy region. But in order to make contributions, it would have to be up in the 100 ton uh, scale uh, detector, or let's say 100 tons for many years in order for those measurements to be contributing to uh, better measurements of the CNO and other lower energy solar neutrinos. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor McDonald. Uh, that was great. So um, we have a few questions in the chat. Um, so the first one comes from Anwisha Sahu, who asks if snow can detect antineutrinos and overall can antineutrinos from other interstellar sources be detected in the same way as solar neutrinos? Yes, it can detect uh, antineutrinos, but uh, uh, it uh, does so uh, in uh, uh, ways that are similar to uh, uh, 
the uh, measurements of uh, um, with light water, uh, where you have a sensitivity for an antineutrino uh, uh, interacting on uh, on the uh, proton in the uh, light water, and so the snow, as you can see here in the second book, second item, uh, made measurements of uh, electron antineutrinos from the sun. We know that, of course, the sun predominantly produces electron uh, neutrinos, but there is the possibility of that original process that uh, Pontecorvo proposed of an oscillation into uh, electron antineutrinos or other uh, processes enhanced in other ways for that transition to take place. But none were observed, as far as I know, in terms of solar uh, measurements, uh, nothing has been observed for any neutrinos from the sun. In terms of other stellar sources, it's simply uh, one over R squared question, and there's no likelihood of uh, any terrestrial detectors other than in burst mode, where these detectors are very sensitive to supernova in our galaxy, typically, or maybe out to the large Magellanic cloud. Um, there you can observe uh, all neutrino types in various ways in uh, uh, these types of detectors, but uh, you couldn't observe them uh, in steady state. Thanks. So uh, I have a question. Um, can you talk about, especially when you had your first elastic scattering uh, measurement, if you guys did analyses of the um, expected oscillation parameters, uh, you know, as I know the first few papers didn't have that, but I, I was wondering if you did that internally. If we did it, say it again. If, if you did an internal analysis of the uh, expected oscillation parameters to the to the data sets you were seeing. Oh yes, we did. We were we were working on that at the same time as as the community was, and uh, but but uh, of course the community that uh, of uh, uh, theorists who approached this question um, devoted all their time in some cases to these analyses, and in our case. Uh, we were moving on with uh, the next phases of the experiment. And so predominantly uh, the uh, results on such global analyses were uh, uh, provided by the uh, uh, theoretical community. All right, uh, I think we're out of time. So uh, I'll thank Professor McDonald again. That was very nice. Um, any further discussions will be pushed into the Slack channel. and. Uh, that wraps us up for this session. Um, 